For those that are not familiar with AgriAbility, it's a USDA-sponsored program that assists farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural workers with disabilities. Each AgriAbility project is a partnership between a land-grant university and at least one disability services organization. Currently, there are 23 AgriAbility projects covering a total of 25 states around the country. And again, if you'd like more information about AgriAbility, please uh, see www.agriability.org. Just a little background on today's webinar. Uh, our response was quite overwhelming. Uh, we were very surprised at the number of people that signed up to participate in this webinar. And we realized just looking at the uh, affiliations of some of the people that signed up, there's no way that we're going to be able to address the interests and needs of that broad spectrum of people in just one session. So today will kind of be a, the beginning of a, hopefully an ongoing dialogue on this topic. We will also um, be sending out a web survey, and that will be listed at the end of the webinar, uh, that you can give us some feedback on topics that you would like to hear on this, this uh, particular subject of emergency preparedness for rural residents with disabilities. In addition, we are looking at starting a community of interest on this topic that will consist primarily of uh, teleconferences, phone calls, where you can uh, dial in and talk with other professionals that are working in this area, and there'll be more information about that. Toward the end of the presentation, there'll be a list of resources. We will uh, leave those up after the entire webinar is finished. The entire question and answer period is over. We'll return to that slide so that you can uh, go to those links if you want or, or copy them down. So when we get to that slide, don't feel like you have to uh, try to write those down all, all at the same time. We will be uh, leaving that slide up for you. Uh, just to let you know who is um, going to be participating in the, in the uh, webinar today, uh, Dr. Bill Field is the Extension Safety Specialist and Professor here in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Purdue. Uh, he began the Breaking New Ground Resource Center in 1979, which was a model for the AgriAbility Project that began in 1991. And he has also uh, been teaching some Homeland Security classes here at Purdue, including an agro-security class. Steve Wetschrak is our Agricultural Rescue Training Specialist. He has an extensive history in terms of working with emergency preparedness. He's been a, a volunteer firefighter for approximately 35 years, was a county director of the Homeland Security uh, Initiatives here in Tippecanoe County, Indiana, and also worked on some of the state emergency preparedness planning uh, committees. Gail Dubois also assisted in the preparation of our uh, webinar materials today. He is the uh, project engineer at the National AgriAbility Project, has a PhD in mechanical engineering, and also farmed for about 25 years, so he has a, a unique perspective on this topic. Also, I want to give thanks to Kate Cook, who prepared the PowerPoint slides, and Cliff Raz, who is our IT specialist, assisting with the technical aspects of the webinar. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bill Field, and he'll uh, begin with the main body of the webinar. Again, if you have questions, please type those in the chat room, hit the arrow, and you'll... Greetings. Uh, again, this is, I'm Bill Field. I'm on the staff here at Purdue, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this webinar, and we're hoping that it'll be uh, one of a series that uh, will continue. Uh, we're real pleased that uh, so many of you have signed up. We were, we were a little overwhelmed by the number that signed up. We didn't quite expect that number originally, and I know that some of you will be coming and going as the uh, hour goes by based on other needs that you have. There's an interesting scene in a book uh, written by Rolvog that's entitled Giants in the Earth, and it's kind of an interesting account of an of a early settler in the upper Midwest who was caught in an early blizzard as he was uh, heading home with his team of oxen. And he knew that he wasn't going to survive in the open. And he slaughtered one of the oxen, gutted it out, and climbed inside of the carcass, the warm carcass of this giant animal, and survived through the night and was able to, uh, the next morning after the storm had passed, to make his way home, but with one less oxen. And then there's also an inter interesting little clip at the end of the movie Twister 
that uh, many of you probably saw many years ago because of some of the fantastic special effects in it with tractors and combines flying through the air. But as the scene sort of winds down, uh, there's, there's a cut to, a, to a, a picture of a farm family climbing up out of their storm shelter and everything in devastation, their barn's gone, their house is gone, and yet they still are alive. Uh, there's two kids and a mother and a father and, and there was garbage all over the top of the storm shelter and, and yet they were to make it out. And I think that's one of the issues that we're really going to be wrestling, wrestling with here today is, is, a, is the issue of preparedness. Uh, it's hoped that through this session that, that we're doing today, we're going to begin a dialogue that we hope will last for some time on looking at the vulnerabilities of, of rural and farm residents who uh, have disabilities, have special needs, that um, may be even worsened during times of natural man-made disasters uh, because of those disabilities and maybe because of the lack of services. Uh, we're going to focus again on this first fundamental step of emergency management and that is uh, preparedness. You know, if it wasn't for the, the, the resiliency of that settler to think about his oxen as a, basically a, a shelter in place or the family to have prepared for a storm by having a storm shelter built and nearby, uh, that neither one of them would have survived. And we're hoping that through this dialogue that we will increase the likelihood of more people surviving tough times that are, are certainly going to be uh, on us in the future. Uh, I'm, we have a number of desired outcomes that we're, uh, we're, we're going to try to address today. Uh, if we can move things along here. We're not moving. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, we had a little technical glitch there. Uh, the, the outcomes that we uh, have outlined for today, and I just want to walk through those, include that we want to be able to uh, uh, have you better understand the importance of agriculture and rural communities in the national well-being. We want to describe the scope and the nature of disability within the farm and ranch community, as especially with uh, many of you may not be aware of the, just how large a population that is. We want to identify the most common threats and consequences to the security of these individuals that are living with disabilities in rural communities. We want to describe some of the basic emergency preparedness measures needed to enhance the resiliency of people with disabilities living in rural communities and apply some basic emergency management principles to a few case studies that we're going to talk about. And then finally identify some of the key resources that you can turn to to uh, broaden your understanding of uh, preparing for times of crisis with uh, individuals with disabilities. Some of the basic assumptions that we're working with, and, and I understand that Paul has addressed a few of those already, but uh, we, we do have an extremely diverse audience online today and some of you have considerable experience in emergency management and have worked in it for a number of years and others are on the line that have very little background and may be actually a person with a disability interested in enhancing their capacity to respond to events that might occur. Uh, we, we also understand that many of you know probably more about some of the specifics the legalities of emergency management at the state or national level than we do. Uh, we, and we look forward to your contributions uh, to, to strengthen our presentations because of uh, your, your experience and application of those, uh, the, the legislation and the administrative rules concerning Homeland Security. Some of the issues that uh, relate to providing emergency management services goes way beyond uh, the scope of what we're able to cover in this short one-hour session. And, and quite frankly, there isn't enough money or personnel or motivation in every case to meet everybody's need uh, during times of disaster. And, and we're sitting here today and we're making no assumption that we're going to meet all of your needs with respect to how to do that more effectively. Four is that everyone is vulnerable to risk or the potential of being impacted by a natural or man-man disaster. Uh, there are no safe places, there's no leaders or no policies that can guarantee or ensure absolute security anywhere. And, and so you need to recognize that, uh, uh, that bad things are going to continue to happen and we need to be uh, at least considering uh, the, uh, the topic of preparedness for, for everyone involved. 
Disasters are not partial to or respecters of persons, even if that group or person is part of a, a protected class, such as persons with disabilities. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of stories about tornadoes seem to strike uh, frequently into mobile home parks, and I think that's kind of the issues that we, uh, we deal with is um, it's oftentimes it's those the, with the greatest social needs that seem to suffer the most from disasters of this kind. Uh, number six is Homeland Security begins at home. It's a very fundamental uh, issue that I teach in all of the classes is that uh, if you're going to be prepared for these events, it starts not, not in Washington or not in our state capital. It starts at our home. And if we're going to be uh, resilient during these times of crisis, we're going to have to have given some consideration to being prepared for them. And so, again, we'll often come back to this point throughout uh, any of these presentations that we do, or even today, that um, uh, personal responsibility is an important part of being prepared for, for a disaster of any kind. And then no one should assume that the government can solve everybody's problem. I think that's been an, uh, an issue that we've wrestled with with major events like Katrina, where there's this expectation that uh, somebody's going to come in within a few hours and solve my problem. And the reality is uh, that everyone that's uh, working within the area of Homeland Security keeps pressing back that individuals need to be personally prepared to deal with those first few hours or maybe a day or two without any assistance, mainly because of just the tremendous need that exists and the limited resources that are available. Let's start with uh, some of the basic points here, and we're going to be addressing them as they were in the expected outcomes. Agriculture is identified as the first of 18 sectors of the National Critical Infrastructure Protection Plan, which came out as part of the Homeland Security Presidential Directive 7. And some of you have n maybe not have a clue about that, but many of you do. And, and it's interesting that agriculture is uh, considered, you know, an extremely important part of being prepared at the federal level because we're so dependent upon agriculture for our food and, and, and other needs that we have. Uh, the agriculture currently in this country is almost entirely under private ownership, uh, which uh, makes it um, very difficult to try to uh, mandate specific kinds of uh, preparedness steps that, that you might find in, in more corporate settings or in public settings. Um, it's composed of about 2.1 million individually owned farms and ranches and other sites scattered throughout the country. It accounts for about one-fifth of the nation's econ economic activity. It's a very important engine that drives our economy. It's highly dispersed over areas with very low population density. It's highly decentralized with respect to governmental and regulatory control and emergency services. And then historically, uh, most of rural America is located in settings that, that have few medical and emergency response services uh, that uh, are, are, are readily available and that are going to be able to uh, respond to all the needs that might occur, if, especially if there's a widespread kind of an event. The incidence of disability within the farm and ranch and rural population are the same or possibly higher than in urban settings. In some cases, they're actually higher. We estimate that between one and two million individuals with disabilities live or work on farms and ranches. One of the problems with um, trying to determine actual counts is that uh, we really don't even know how many farms there are in this country, how many farm owners there are, how many farm laborers there are, and we have a number of different data sources that we can turn to, and when we apply those uh, data sources uh, to our formulas that we're looking at disability distribution, we come up with a fairly broad range, but the point is, is that there's uh, well over a million individuals out there that most live in rural communities with disabilities that could be impacted during a time of a crisis. Some of the studies have shown up to 24 percent of the farm population have physical disabilities uh, that um, are uh, uh, hindering them in some way. Approximately 19 percent of the population out there that farm or work as farm workers are unable to perform certain daily tasks that are required or needed because of a disability and may have to reassign those tasks to others or modify the tasks to accommodate them using assistive technology or some other form of, um, of aid. The average f age of a farm operator in the U.S. right now is about 59 and over 17 percent of farmers and ranchers are over 65 years of age. We're working with a fairly old, older population, 
that uh, may have special needs with respect to uh, uh, times of disaster or, or, or in preparing for those events. The frequency of traumatic injuries are, tend to be higher in rural communities, especially amputations and spinal cord injuries and head injuries because of the uh, serious or severe uh, disabilities that are result from farm-related injuries. And we know that farming continues to be one of the most hazardous occupations in the country that contributes to this continuous flow of, uh, of workers who have disabilities. And then there's a higher percentage of mental, behavioral, health-related disabilities that uh, occur in rural communities. And, and, and I think we're going to address this in a little bit, but there are very few resources to address this problem, and it's really not well understood. Uh, rural communities in general have a disproportion of persons who are older, affected by disability, or have fewer economic resources. And so it's not quite the, the, the lifestyle that we often see pictured in short commercials or in, in uh, publications of rural people seemingly uh, very content and, and having few problems. But in, in reality, there are many living in rural America that are, are what we would call part of the hidden poor or those individuals that are largely underserved by many of the programs that we take for granted because we live in an urban setting. Placing rural disability issues within the risk management framework uh, brings us to the point of how do we determine asset ri risks? Things like threats, consequences, and vulnerabilities. These are issues that are addressed in corporate world, they're addressed at the, the federal level with respect to uh, uh, parts of our national critical infrastructure. And, and many of these things are the same whether you live in a rural community or, or in an urban setting. But in a rural setting, the most common threats we see are tornadoes and floods, uh, winter storms that we've just seen come through the Midwest that uh, caused a lot of havoc and isolation for people, wildfires, uh, temperature extremes, dust storms, criminal activities, agro-terrorism, which uh, has uh, not become a significant issue, but it's something that people are concerned about. And it might be of interest to know that much agro-terrorism that occurs in this country is typically carried out by disgruntled workers who, who can cause an awful lot of havoc very quickly because of their ability to know the system and, and how to get into it. And then there's also crop and livestock diseases that has uh, ha have the potential of causing a lot of harm to rural families that depend upon crop and livestock production for their livelihood. Some of the uh, images we're just trying to pop through here is uh, are familiar to many of you, but uh, we, it, we here in Indiana live in uh, Torn Tornado Alley. Uh, we have a very high number historically of, of uh, fatalities related to tornadoes. And most of us who have worked in emergency preparedness have, have uh, seen in scenes like this throughout the state. And sometimes they're very spotty and other times they leave wide swaths that uh, impact an awful lot of people. Um, Winter storms, as I mentioned, we just uh, discussed that briefly, and I'll jump over that. Wildfires, which tend to be more in the western part of the country, uh, can cover thousands of acres and do an awful lot of damage and cause uh, m many families to uh, evacuate their homes because there's just really no controlling these large fires, uh, even with all the equipment that we currently have available. It just It's not economically possible, and so many times they have to just be allowed to burn out. Some of the consequences, uh, which we briefly touched on, is loss of livelihood for families uh, that often times are long term because uh, uh, crops and livestock are not easily replaced and it takes a, a, a quite a length of time to get things back into production. Loss of communications during these uh, incidents, loss of basic services, whether they be water or electricity, uh, deterioration of existing health conditions that might uh, occur because of um, uh, just not having access to health care during long periods of time where people are isolated, the inability to travel. I know that during our recent uh, winter storms, uh, we went three days where we weren't able to get on the roads. The roads were closed uh, except for essential services or travel. And loss of housing, which uh, in rural communities, uh, there isn't much rural housing. And if a person loses their house, they're unable to uh, just go out and rent another apartment. They're, they oftentimes have to move into town, which starts a, a whole process of changes in their lives that uh, sometimes are very hard to recover from. And then we throw in this consequence of secondary conditions. As 
that, that people that may have a disability that's aggravated or enhanced or worsened because of, of their exposure to things like uh, smoke or, or dust or other things uh, that uh, we may not think about immediately, but a person with a disability that um, is sensitive to those things can, it can be a real problem. Some of the characteristics of rural life that may increase vulnerabilities uh, that uh, we, we may not think about too much, but uh, isolation is one of them. Oftentimes a major storm will go through a, an area and we have people that might live 20 or 30 miles from town or, the, or maybe even in the western parts, 20 or 30 miles from their nearest neighbor. And it's not easy to know what's going on in all those different sites. Travel and response time for emergency medical services uh, is greatly increased. Uh, it, in where I'm sitting right now uh, on the Purdue University campus, if we were to uh, experience a, a, a medical emergency, we would have someone here that's fairly well trained within six or seven minutes uh, because of uh, our excellent uh, uh, staff that we have and that's trained and, and readily available. Uh, yet where I live at, at home, that response time might be 15 or 20 minutes because we, I live quite a few miles out of town uh, on an old farmstead and oftentimes We've had to send someone down to the uh, junction of our road to the main road just because they have trouble finding our road. And so that response time becomes a problem for many people that may need assistance very quickly because of a, a medical emergency or, or, or other kind of problem. The quality and quantity of emergency services is also an issue. Uh, it, it, in town here where I live or where I'm working currently is that uh, our emergency medical services uh, probably respond to one uh, heart-related incident every day or two, and so they get fairly well trained. If you live in a rural community and you're, and you're being served by a, a volunteer emergency medical uh, services uh, um, unit, is that they may not see that kind of incident very often, and they may not be as trained or up-to-date on, on dealing with it. They're doing the best they can, but they just don't, freak, don't see the frequency of these events. And so they may overlook things that might not be overlooked by a team that uh, handles these kinds of problems more frequently. There's also a lack of emergency management planning. Uh, we're quite clear from the federal uh, efforts is that every county in the United States is supposed to be involved in emergency planning activities, but many rural counties don't have the resources for that. They often assign it to a part-time person who may develop some emergency plans for some of the more uh, vulnerable targets or some of the more high profile targets, but there isn't the energy that goes into planning for not only the, the, those that live in town or, but also those that may live on the outskirts or if it's very sparsely populated. Some of the services may be very minimal that uh, are established in, this, in, in order to be better prepared during a disaster. There's also a lack of resources because of a lack of tax base and, and so there's just fewer dollars to go around to, um, to do some of this in many rural communities. Lack of accessible service and facilities. For example, we may set up a warming center here in town or in, in a city where people or older people can come during uh, very cold weather to, uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, warmth. We also may set up cooling uh, centers in the, in, during hot weather. But in a rural community, we're talking about having someone travel 30, 40, 50 miles for those kinds of services, and so they're less likely to be successful. And there's, as I mentioned earlier, almost a complete lax, lack of, of uh, mental and behavioral health services in many rural areas of this country. There's been efforts to try to um, implement those kinds of services, but it's been quite difficult because of the lack of funding and, and, uh, and just the lack of, a, of cash flow to sustain those kinds of services uh, because of fewer people. And then there's also a lower awareness and sensitivity concerning disability issues. Uh, many rural communities haven't wrestled much with the issue of disability and, and oftentimes we're, uh, we may struggle with questions of image and, and what to do and, and maybe uh, uh, there may be some um, lack of sensitivity towards this population and so we, we just um, need to recognize that uh, not everyone has this, uh, the same level of respect and, and uh, interest that, uh, that you might sit, find in a more uh, urban-based setting. Some of the unique assets of rural life that uh, I think help 
counterbalance some of those vulnerabilities include in, in most rural communities there are fewer high profile targets uh, you know everybody loves a farmer uh, we just don't see as many um, threats that might occur out in those rural communities uh, th with respect to um, being targeted there's also a historical emphasis in many rural communities on preparedness because of necessity that dates back to when people were very isolated and we see the, the greater likelihood of, of rural families and farm families to have a backup power source such as generator and they have the ability to quickly install it and provide services to uh, not only uh, their home but also to provide for their livestock uh, that's very important especially water snowmobiles and food stocks uh, uh, we, t we tend to think that more rural people tend to can and have vegetables stored away and those kind of things. That may not always be true, but I think there's at least that, that ideal there that uh, might be more evident uh, in rural communities. There are boats and snow removal equipment that can be tapped that sometimes is not available in more urban-based settings where people just don't have that equipment sitting in their garage. I think there's also an enhanced network in place uh, that includes both volunteer and paid emergency services uh, that um, uh, work together and, and uh, have that very strong camaraderie associated with uh, making something like that work in a rural community. There are existing farm and rural organizations and rural churches that have become very uh, instrumental in keeping some rural communities together. And these, these organizations and programs tend to provide uh, very strong responses during times of crisis. And I think that volunteer spirit that uh, uh, I'm having worked in rural communities uh, most of my life uh, is, seems to be much more evident, uh, especially when the need is important. Uh, whether, whether it be after a fire or the cow's getting out or a storm comes through, it's amazing how many people show up and pick up trucks with chainsaws with no expectations to be paid, but just to try to get the roads opened up and get trees off of people's houses and those kind of things. And I think there, there's a, one might argue that overall that there might be a higher level of natural resiliency in many rural communities uh, just because of, of the nature of those communities, that historical social contract that exists between rural people and urban people, that uh, expectation and, and that, that they may try to keep uh, uh, and maintain and protect uh, that reputation over time. Emergency man management issues that may arise for persons with disabilities living in rural communities is quite broad and oftentimes complex and it'd be hard to try to address every single one or what, we, what we've done is just try, tried to look at some of the uh, ones that we feel are fairly important based on talking with emergency um, providers. Number one is uh, emergency services become inaccessible during major events, whether it be tornadoes or floods storms mainly they're overwhelmed there's not that many ambulances or fire trucks to go around and they tend to be directed to where the needs are the greatest and so individuals that may have serious needs uh, may have to wait long periods of time before those services uh, can uh, get to them because of impassable roads or wire wires are down trees are down and so that becomes an issue and it doesn't matter how many times you call 911 uh, there's only so much that that dispatcher can do and, and typically within the first 15 or 20 minutes of a major storm every piece of emergency uh, medical or fire rescue equipment has already been dispatched and there isn't much to go around and it, it's going to require one to be uh, one of those uh, units to be uh, uh, redirected and sometimes that's very difficult to do. There may be a loss of essential services for some of these individuals, such as life support, where the power goes out, they're going to have to have some kind of a backup to provide electricity to keep a respirator going or, or uh, to keep the battery charged on the, uh, on, the, on the power chair or whatever it might be, or dialysis services that are uh, required and may often um, have, uh, uh, have to be done at a distant location where they either have a a van service or a, a transportation service that transport them or they have to drive. Again, if transportation is closed, uh, getting dialysis service may become a critical problem. And then accessible communications for people who are hard of hearing uh, may be shut down. And so being able to communicate to those who are struggling uh, may be difficult. I, I'm reminded of, um, in this particular point, of 
a Amish family that um, had some deaf children and uh, everyone in the community got together and learned sign language, not just the family, but there was 25 or 30 people that, from the Amish community that showed up to, to learn sign language so that they all could be a su support network for that individual family where they were all learning sign language together. There's lack of recovery services uh, that we might see in an urban setting, uh, such as Salvation Army, Red Cross, and other groups that might pop in and provide uh, housing or clothing or so forth. Sometimes that may not be as readily available in a, in a rural setting. There are a few sources of replacement assistive technology. If you're very dependent upon a wheelchair or other mobility aid or hearing aids or whatever, uh, those uh, products may have come from quite a distance. and and so getting access to them might become a, a serious problem. And then there's also this element, we, whether it be a, um, you know, a detriment or not, but uh, we've often found that individuals with uh, disabilities living out there in the rural settings tend to be overly independent and often are reluctant to seek assistance until things get pretty bad. And, and then that becomes a much more difficult problem to respond to. Okay, we're going to switch here at this point to uh, Steve Wetrack, and Steve brings a wealth of on-the-ground experience in dealing with responding to emergencies, and he's going to cover basic emergency management preparedness measures. Thank you, Dr. Field, and uh, thank you for the comments. And we'd like to go through and, and just look over, uh, as most of you know, and, and, and some of you have heard, that uh, building a plan, looking at preparedness plans, is, is can be very entailed. And we want to look at some of the things that uh, that, that stand out that, that would help you in, in looking at plans if you don't currently have one or looking at preparedness measures. Uh, there are uh, literally... Uh, a lot of documents out there that you can go and, and have a very good uh, base to start with. But when we talk about preparedness, we talk about ongoing uh, activities, tasks, and things like that to make sure that we take care of everything that could possibly happen in, in our communities. And we start laying that out. We look at prevention. We look at recovery, response, uh, mitigation, and those things. We want to make sure that in the preparedness plan we've covered uh, most, if not all, those. There's also going to be exercising that particular preparedness plan that you put together and looking at those different things, making sure that they work in your community and uh, things that you uh, can be uh, uh, keenly aware of, what you can get your hands on and what, maybe what you can't. Communications and warning and things like that are going to be a big issue also in the preparedness process, making sure that everybody's notified uh, the best that you can uh, for the different types of preparedness emergencies that you might have. Also, some of the last things that you might look at as we go through this and we look at different plans is, is disaster and emergency management preparedness uh, is an ongoing process uh, for the prevention and the mitigation and to prepare for the response to maintain these, these certain events. We also want to look at the recovery period and preparedness and the threatens uh, that might threaten the property or life as this particular disaster goes on and, and as we look at the preparedness of that. And last again, as like I said before, exercising that particular preparedness plan you've put together. Make sure that it works. Make sure that it's something that's feasible in your communities and things like that. Some of the ones that we've laid out here is preventative identified meeting places, uh, predetermined uh, areas that we can go to. Uh, in each and every community, maybe in your daily life, at your particular business that you might be at or the, your workplace or your home or your rural setting or whatever, you want to make sure that those places are identified. A lot of times when, uh, when that disaster uh, occurs, uh, whatever it may be in your rural community or, or around the nation, uh, we, we see a lot of notification of people thinking, well, I, I thought it would go around us and I thought it wasn't there. So you need to determine where that meeting place is going to be so that you know how to take care of making sure everybody's been accounted for. Evacuation plans, very important, not only if uh, you're at home in that community or if you're in the rural setting or your workplace again, uh, making sure you have an evacuation plan and make sure everybody understands that plan. It's one thing to, to have the plan, but if nobody knows exactly where they are in a building, if they're only in that building for a few hours a day, or if you've got somebody that's come to your home or to your business for that particular day in the rural settings also, 
you want to make sure they understand how to get to those places. External contact points, one of the things that we talk about a lot and we see a lot of uh, in emergencies throughout the, uh, throughout the country is making sure that we have a contact point maybe outside of the area code that we're currently in. So maybe you want to set up a set of phone numbers uh, that you can contact to let somebody know your well-being or how you are and you might make a contact in another area code in another part of the United States or wherever you might be whether in a rural committee or wherever let them know uh, that you are all right and 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 you can take uh, you know you're going to call them back as soon as you can and let them know so an external contact point is 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 perfect it works out good uh, you'll find that most of your phone systems uh, in, even in today's date with all the technology we have uh, some of those areas have trouble getting that information out. We talk about stockpiling seven days of essential supplies. We, we talk about a couple different ones, medication, special diets. I know that there's, there's terminology out there with ready-to-go bags and things like that, that that other agencies talk about, but in some cases those are a shorter supply. You need to know in the rural communities if, you know, if you've got some problems with insulin needs or, or special daily medications that you have to have or special diet needs, you might need to do an extended period of that because again, like Dr. Field has alluded to, you are in a community that uh, that's not going to be right next to the, the, the local pharmacy to pick up those things. The next item we have on there is utilizing the 911 system and the E911 system in some parts of the United States. You want to be able to contact these and you should be able to contact these departments and let them know each and every piece of vital information that you think you have in a rural community or a special needs individual that they have that information on the screen in front of you when you send out that call or that call comes in or that disaster comes in they can let those emergency responders the fire ems law enforcement um, all the other agencies that may be responding if any special needs that you might have and this is part of what they do each and every day they expand upon that it's just another tool that the emergency responders can use and it's there for your use and you need to let them know uh, exactly what some of them special needs might be. So again, in the, in the next item, it talks about the special needs. Don't be afraid to let those people know that. That's exactly what they want. Uh, medical identification bracelets. If you don't have those, you need to make sure that uh, you uh, get one of those because again, these are people that's maybe never been in your area before. They may be coming from outside areas if it's a large disaster. They may be coming from counties away or even sometimes in states away. So you need to get that information to them to make it easier for them to figure out you know, exactly what your needs are and they steer down the right road. A form of peer support networks, those are all kinds of special needs uh, in your actual your communities. There's programs out there, just community emergency response teams are one of them throughout the United States and areas. But you want to make sure that you've got that peer support uh, with local agencies, whether it be towns, cities, uh, rural communities, and pull those people together so they can help you. Again, Dr. Field alluded to the warming stations and cooling shelters. Those are things that you need to have laid out in your communities ahead of time. Some of those are going to be readily available. Some of them are going to take minutes or hours to get to your location. Neighborhood watches and other connect, uh, connections around uh, your communities. Uh, neighborhood watch programs are very important in times of disasters. That's one of the things that might not come up right away. But if you're going to be taken away from your facility, you might want to have a neighborhood watch type program that we don't have people that might come in and do serious property damage to your particular area or your farm, your rural community, or whatever the case may be. Meals on Wheels, Postal Services, and, and Utility Company Alerts all other things that you need to talk about. You need to make sure that these are things that you would normally depend on every day and there may be such a case that they're not going to be able to get to you in a short time period. So you want to lay all these out in your preparedness plans uh, uh, initially. And there probably isn't anything that you think that you maybe don't need to have in a plan. You need to put as much in there as you possibly can because in most cases it's not always going to be the plan that you prepare for. Uh, the best plan or the best known disaster that you've prepared for probably is the one that ever happens. So you need to make sure you have all of that information in there. So we're going to go into some case studies now. I will uh, also talk further about some of the preparedness measures in one of my case studies and some of the things that will help you, I hope, as you go down the road of preparing these plans. Thank you. We have rolling chairs here that allow us to move back and forth real quickly. And again, I, one of the things I've, I feel frustrated by this approach is I'd like to stop and say, do you have any questions out there? 
uh, and I know that that's not a workable solution at this point. Uh, what uh, uh, I do appreciate uh, Steve uh, covering those uh, things to get ready for, and, and there's a lot of those um, that may, maybe many of you haven't thought about, and, and I was just talking with Steve beforehand about the uh, programs like uh, uh, Meals on Wheels that require uh, the driver to actually visually see the, the recipient of the meal every day and then the postal service that uh, uh, programs that uh, for, for those who may be um, not able to get out frequently where the post office uh, mail delivery person would uh, postman would would actually make a call if someone had picked up their mail well, many of these programs exist out there or it wouldn't be very hard to start if, if, if uh, these agencies were just approached and asked about it. So uh, at this point, we wanted to just cover a few case studies. And I'm going to cover two. And Steve's going to pop back in and cover the third one. And it was in discussing this, one of the topics that kept coming up related to fire. Uh, we look at uh, many scenarios that uh, fire is the threat. And a person with a disability uh, may have greater vulnerability because of their uh, lack of mobility and so forth. But it seemed to be a, a constant uh, topic raised in conversations uh, as to uh, what am I going to do in the event of a fire? And, and so there was uh, several case studies that we, we drew from uh, related to fire, including people who were in a building and a home and that caught on fire. and having to bail out the back window because they just hadn't thought up a, a way to get out any other way, or the farmer in a combine that catches on fire and, and then having to uh, uh, evacuate the combine in the field with it on fire and, and still have very limited mobility. Uh, the topic I, or the case that, that um, I wanted just to focus on was a farmer who was out in the early spring when the grass is dead and and there's just a lot of dry material. It's when everybody wants to burn brush. And he was out burning brush in a fairly uh, uh, pastured area with lots of uh, dry grass, very tall dry grass. He was bush hogging and, and, uh, and, and cleaning out uh, ditch banks and so forth. And then he, he realized that he, he was surrounded by a grass fire. And here he is uh, with a, his uh, limited mobility he has a tractor with modifications with hand controls. It's not easy for him to get on and off, and he realizes that he's um, in this setting with this wildfire surrounding him. And and just the responses that he had was, well, should I, what am I going to do? Am I going to try to bush hog the fire? Or am I going to try to drive through it? Uh, he eventually got close to one area where it was burning through, and he got into a, a, a burned out area. Uh, where it allowed the fire then to go on by him, but in the process he did receive some burns, and and now he, he's uh, much more sensitive about where he is, and and I think we could take this case study and say let's let's look at the problems here, is for example uh, did he have communications, uh, could he call somebody to say you know what I'm in the middle of a brush fire, and a wildfire here I'm on a tractor and I can't get off I can't get through it, uh, you know can somebody come and help me. Uh, d had he looked at these circumstances before he entered them uh, to, to try to prevent this from occurring. But, you know, we could take and analyze this particular case uh, to, to great length, but I think that uh, we could all agree at the end that we probably uh, um, could have prevented this from occurring with some, or have reduced the impact of this by having some fairly simple steps uh, followed uh, prior to uh, going to work in that setting. The other example is one that um, has occurred on numerous occasions over the 30 years that I've been working with rural people with disabilities, and that is people caught outside um, that um, uh, during frigid weather and then end up ending up freezing to death or being severely frostbitten uh, due to exposure. And just this past couple of weeks, uh, we had an older woman who walked to the neighbors uh, during one, one of our very bad storms that came through and the uh, neighbor initially took the woman back home and then she shortly thereafter went back to the neighbor and in the process um, that they, she couldn't raise their attention and walked back home and they found her body 
the next morning frozen on her own front step. And here a case of a, a, an older woman who was disoriented and was looking for assistance and, and resulted in freezing to death uh, because of exposure. And, and again, we could analyze this whole thing and, and, and look at it and say, how could we have prevented this from occurring? And I think all of us could come up with some steps that would have worked uh, quite effectively. Uh, Steve's going to share one that is a little bit more broad, dealing with a tornado, and we've entitled it For the Birds. Yeah, thank you again. And uh, the, the title becomes very interesting, but not, does not show up to the end of the little short little presentation here. In 1994, this county and, and community received one of the worst tornadoes that we'd ever seen in this community with death and loss of life. And but one of the things I want to talk about very quickly is, is uh, in this particular uh, five mile stretch of a tornado, we had 135 unaccounted people the next morning. Most of those were elderly, most of them. Um, some of them uh, had disabilities, and it became a huge issue at midnight that particular night. These were low income, elderly people that lived in one of the mobile home parks that we had, but also had passed through a rural community that went right through a housing addition. Uh, we had piles of debris, as you do in, in other locations. I know this is not extreme, but piles of debris 60 foot tall. But what we had immediately was, when we did locate some of the people, the immediate needs was their daily medications, their oxygen tanks with the fixed incomes that they were on. They'd have no way to have any extra wheelchairs, walkers, or any of those kind of things. So any, anything life-saving was gone. Uh, it was very obvious that we couldn't do everything. Uh, we had a large response from all over this part of the state. But we actually activated an urban search and rescue that came in and not only looked for the elderly and some of the people that we were missing, but some of the vital items that was for them out of the Indianapolis area and helped us very tremendously in coming back. We had 45 broken uh, lines of, of natural gas, 15 fires going on at one time. We actually did have a, an individual that she had uh, been blown out of the uh, chair that she was in and she had to walk with either a walker or a wheelchair. Uh, and, and found her then just sitting in the middle of, a, uh, of an area that was just on a kitchen chair, but she couldn't move on her own. So a lot of those disabilities of things we need to think about ahead of time. So we had 15 different fires going on at that particular time. But some of the other things that, that came out of that is, is the amount of people that, that had more special needs than probably we even realized in our own community. Uh, some of the things that, that maybe we all don't think about is, is, is a lot of people take care of their personal house pets as one of their family members. And that's what's leading me to the end of this is we had a lot of individuals uh, that were very concerned about maybe what was left. And I know in, in rural communities and throughout the United States, that's going to be an issue. 911 became very busy as they did in, in the early uh, onsets as it does anywhere in a national disaster. But some of the things we found out was going back to the oldest way of communication. Uh, CB radios in some cases or just VHF radios so it helped a little bit get through that but I think our biggest problem was as we go through it is 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 what happens in that fourth fifth sixth and seventh day of making sure that we're still trying to locate the, the items that these individuals need because they don't have maybe the insurance and the money to do that a lot of these people in this community were renting people they just upped and left and never told us about it so it took us an extended three or four days to uh, continue to do the search and rescue, but to find these individuals that maybe just completely left the communities. Uh, we did uh, set up a program and, and there were extra equipment brought in for people that had those special needs with walkers and wheelchairs and things like that. But one of the things I think the biggest thing out of that particular disaster, and there's been many throughout the United States in this community is, is we actually did sit down with all of our local emergency services and we actually developed a countywide animal evacuation and disaster plan. So this was a spinoff of that particular uh, particular disaster. And then I went on to help uh, local uh, people from here at the university and helped uh, develop a disaster plan for FEMA for animals in disaster. So one of those things that maybe you don't think about, but in today's world it's pretty it's pretty important. Uh, but the end of that is is the title is is the birds part of it. We had a, a, a lady that was very, very concerned. It was taken out of her, her residence. Uh, we actually left two of her birds in a cage inside of there. At the time, her concern was to get her out of there because of that. Uh, she was very persistent about letting the 911 dispatchers know and our emergency 
preparedness people to know that she thought that she needed to get back in her. So she was probably the number one person that called uh, in on 911 each and every day, hour on the hour, but it became a very con concern of hers and also for ours enough that we included that in our plan. So that was one of the things I thought that would tie into this. The other part of it is, is that in the, uh, in number nine under the key resources, we look at uh, some of the things in the rural communities and resources that we might have. Some of these resources, of course, we talk about tornadoes and floods and fires and et cetera. You wanna make sure that you've prepared for all of those, not just one in particular. County Extension Services, uh, they have a lot of information that they can hand out as far as hand out information to help you out. Local emergency planning committees are, uh, can help you with help you setting up these pre-plans. Peer groups could be special need group for disasters. And you want to think long term. These disasters don't happen in two or three days. They can go for weeks, months, and then in some cases even a years. Aging, uh, uh, area on aging and agencies on aging would be housing. They could ha take care of housing. They could also have you with special needs on vans. Uh, churches, feeding, housing, and shelters is something that falls into play all the time with the churches. Non-governmental organizations, they are support groups for disasters. And, and, and again, the last thing I'd like to add is, is remember most all disasters uh, go on for a long period of time and you need to pre-plan for that and put that in your preparedness plan that this isn't gonna just happen the next day and you're not gonna wave the magic wand. You need to make sure that you prepare for all of those. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Paul Jones and he's gonna speak about some additional resources. Thank you. We do uh, thank our presenters for their uh, expertise on this subject, and we will we'll be entertaining questions and answers in just a, a few minutes. We do have a list of web-based resources. Uh, I'm going to leave uh, just briefly while I'm talking now, but uh, after we're done with our poll and our question and answers and everything is concluded, we will leave these up on the screen for you if you would like to go to those links. Uh, bookmark them, copy them down, whatever you'd like to do. And also at the bottom of this uh, page is our link to the survey that we would like you to participate in. It allows you to make additional comments about the webinar that, that happened today and also asks for your input in terms of future topics that you'd be interested in hearing about on this general topic area. And it also gives you an opportunity to say whether or not you would be interested in participating in our community of interest that we're planning to to conduct. So at this point, I'm going to move to our question and answer pod. Just a quick break here. And again, I would like to invite you, if you have not already, to enter your um, questions into the chat pod on the lower left. Hit the uh, little arrow and that will register with our uh, our support staff and they will record those questions. Um, Cliff Raz is now going to be uh, entering some of the questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do our polls though first. These are just some survey questions to get your feedback. Our first poll question asks about your professional affiliation. And I realize some of you may have more than one affiliation, but please pick the one that's most applicable to you. Uh, I realize some of your uh, emergency preparedness agencies may also be state organizations, so pick the one that's most relevant. If you'd go ahead and click on your screen to the appropriate uh, response, I will post those for everyone to see in just a second. We'll give you just a few more seconds to go ahead and respond, and then we'll post those so that we can go on to our next poll question. So you can get a general idea of who's been participating today, our largest group from emergency preparedness organizations. Our next poll question has to do with your views on the um, quality of the information that was presented today. You could respond and then again we'll broadcast the 
poll results in just a second when we give you an opportunity to click on your preference of those uh, five responses. Okay, you can see the general responses on that question. So we will move on to our third poll so that we have enough time for our questions and answers. The third poll asks about the technology that was used today. If you could give us an idea as, as to whether you felt that it was usable for you or not. And again, you'll have an opportunity if you go to that web survey to give us any specifics you would like in terms of feedback on the, uh, the webinar and the technology. Give you just a few more seconds to complete that and then we'll go ahead and broadcast those results. Okay, you can get an idea of how people felt about the technology. And we have one more poll question before our questions and answers. This is just a general response in terms of whether you would be interested in participating in another webinar in our AgriBility webinar series based on today's webinar. Again, I'll give you a few seconds to uh, complete those responses. Okay, give you an idea of people's opinions about that aspect today. I want to give enough time for our questions and answers, so I'm going to uh, going to uh, exit again, and uh, we'll have some questions. And Dr. Field will uh, go ahead and activate his camera, and uh, then again at the end we will put the to, to, to copy down or to visit the websites we have listed. Well, there are a few questions already up here. The first one that I see is dealing with how do you get medications for your 72-hour kit? I think that's going to be a question between you and your, and your uh, physician. Uh, your physician has the capability of doing that. And then also your insurance company. And there are some insurance companies that, uh, that don't allow for advanced purchase of medications, but uh, it may be through your physician that that might take place. Uh, um, you know, that some of the... The comment here that some pharmacies will not give you any uh, prescriptions a day earlier, that uh, is true. And again, it's going to be a question with your physician and your insurance company to allow you to have at least enough for a seven, five or six or seven day supply, especially if you live in an isolated location. I know that I've traveled overseas and had a prescription filled in advance so that I could take it with me so I wouldn't have to fill it somewhere else. But it did take a physician to make that happen. Well, there's a question I'm not sure whether I can answer. Uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the Community Emergency Preparedness Information Network um, workshop for, and so I, I think I'm gonna need a little bit more explanation there. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, in my mind, in most urban settings or wherever there's a strong emergency planning activity going on, that it would be too difficult to get them convinced to do a workshop for those that are hard of hearing or deaf. Uh, I think it's a matter of asking, going to your local or county emergency management uh, staff and, and asking them what's available. Or if you're in a very rural community where that service may not be available, you may, you may have to find out from the, from the nearest urban setting where those services might be available. But I'm, I'm convinced that in most rural communities, you're going to find, if they're if very isolated, you're going to find many of these services hard to tap because they just don't exist there. Uh, 
Uh, this is a question related to uh, the use of 911 systems. Uh, under the current E911 system, which is enhanced 911, uh, it is possible to enter information on, on disability issues uh, right on the screen so that the dispatcher can bring that up. Uh, I don't understand why someone would stop using E911 why they got it once they got it installed. Uh, maybe Steve might have a response to that, uh, but there are many counties in the United States that still do not have 911 systems in place, and it's, it's because of the cost. It's, uh, it, in order to install that system, everybody pays, and it's become more complicated because that tax for 911 has historically not applied to cell phones, and so as we've moved away from land-based or landline systems to cell phones, is that some of the revenue from that the landline systems has disappeared and they're trying now through legislation to uh, add that on to cell phone cost in order to keep that 911 system active. So it may have been because of that loss of revenue as people move to cell phone use. Well, the question here is what are some of the steps that would have changed the outcomes in the case studies? Well. That was part of our point of bringing them up is for you to think about uh, personally how you might have intervened or how, you, how things might have worked out differently if some emergency preparedness activities had taken place. I, I think, for example, the, uh, the case uh, with respect to the uh, uh, companion animals or the, the pets, uh, it might uh, have been uh, an issue with respect to the first responders and not recognizing the importance role that that animal or those birds played in that person's life. And, and the response was is that they began to look at that as a critical problem, mainly because of the demands it put on the system once that uh, there was a separation between the uh, uh, person with a disability and their animals. And so I think in the future, and at least this county, there's going to be greater sensitivity to try to protect those animals. But there's a limits to those things. I have 20 cows at home that run around. Each one weighs 800, 900 pounds. And if the first responders show up and I demand to take my cows with me, I guess, I mean, I'm pretty close to my cows. And uh, they're, um, I sure would like to take them with me, but the reality is I'm not going to be able to. So uh, there, if, if you show up and you've got a 100-gallon fish tank full of fish, uh, it may not be possible. I mean, the, the basic uh, f foundational orientation of first response folks is to save lives and then sometimes uh, that, that process may result in the loss of other things and and so we have to understand that uh, but in the other cases I talked about is here we had an older woman who um, was disoriented who left her house in the middle of a storm to go seek help from some other person and they tried to help but then the or disorientation didn't go away and next thing you know, they're back out in the uh, severe weather and end up freezing to death. And so there's uh, issues of who else is looking out for her back. Is there anyone there that's, uh, uh, that can call her or is there a place she can go during those times where, where she might be extremely vulnerable? I think there are solutions to those problems, but it's, there's got to be a willingness on the part of that person with a disability to uh, engage in those solutions and, uh, and participate uh, if, you know, Many people died in Katrina, not because uh, lack of emergency services, but because they refused to engage in the opportunity to evacuate or participate in evacuation, and they took those risks, and some did not survive. And we live in a country where people can take risks and, and make choices, uh, and we don't impose our will on others, and so that's an issue that oftentimes confronts first responders who feel like it would be safer for, for people to evacuate, but they're being told, no, we're not going to leave our, our, our home or our animals or whatever it might be. I don't know of any financial resources that are available for setting up volunteer peer support groups, uh, that, uh, but I th I'm not sure that it would cost a lot of money. I think it's really getting to know your neighbors. Uh, we live in a world where we um, have 2,100 friends on Face page but we have no friends in our neighborhood, and I think that's a, a, an issue. And a, maybe to, to have a, um, um, uh, you know, a, get to know your neighbors better, set up a peer support group might be just starting in your neighborhood to do that. Mm -hmm. 
I'm being told this is the last question, so I, I apologize for the shortness here, but I, I hope this is uh, this one will be helpful. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? This uh, material will all be posted and archived uh, as part of the National Agribility Project website, and that would include the images and the content, and uh, we hope that uh, you will uh, utilize it in some way or listen to it again. Uh, we will be uh, more than happy uh, you know, have you have access to it, and I'm not sure when the, that'll occur, but it'll be very shortly after this e event is held. I'm now told we have a few more questions and a little bit more time. Are there any sources of funding or other help for people wishing to make their farm or ranch handicap accessible? Uh, the, uh, we've been in this business for a long time working with farmers with disabilities and trying to help them accommodate disability into agriculture and some of the best sources of funding that we use are vocational rehabilitation services. Every state in the United States has a vocational rehabilitation program funded by state and federal sources and we encourage uh, individuals who feel like they can continue farming if they had that special adaptation or, or needed some assistance to, to work through their voc rehab program. Uh, we encourage uh, as a way to maybe open that door to connect with uh, uh, the agribility staff in those 25 states that have agribility programs and they are very helpful in making those connections with VR. Uh, agribility does not have funding available to make these modifications but um, they have the ability to connect with uh, uh, vocational rehab that oftentimes will provide that funding. We've, ha we've had a very a good experience here in Indiana working with state vocational rehabilitation and paying the cost of needed adaptations to allow for a farmer to continue working. Uh, one of the references that we will cite uh, on the archived version of this will be a paper that was done here, uh, kind of a scholarly paper that looks at the um, uh, uh, distribution of disability within agriculture and rural communities and it's based upon the most recent census of agriculture and USDA data from a variety of their sources and so if anyone's interested in that uh, information that um, that citation will be available it's published in the journal of agromedicine and I wish we could distribute it free of charge or put it online but that violates their um, copyright issues and so you're going to have to go to directly to them to get a copy of that publication. Uh, I think that's an interesting question. I think that in some counties you're going to find agencies like Red Cross sort of being the driving agency. In other communities it's going to be the local emergency planning committee that has a strong <coughs> pardon me, uh, sense of leadership. So I think you're going to have to um, make those contacts and explore which one is most likely going to be able to provide the best services in this area. Sources on affordable shelters. Uh, that would include storm shelters. I think we could include that. Uh, we have a file, I've looked it up a couple of times, on different kinds of storm shelters. Some are partially buried, some are above ground that are concrete. Uh, it's interesting, I worked uh, for a while running a therapeutic horseback riding program that was on a farm that did not have a storm shelter. Uh, we had a close call one time, so we actually built a classroom of reinforced concrete. It looks like a just a simple addition to this building. It has uh, very little limited window space and it is a, uh, an approved storm shelter. Uh, if you tore it apart, you would find that the walls are quite thick and, and yet it met the standards for an above ground shelter. And so there are such a thing and, and it would be, I think if you go online and look under storm shelters, you're gonna find a variety of sources of um, prefab and um, uh, plans for building those kind of shelters. This will be our final question. How effective are simple two-way radio CB for getting and getting 
aid in a disaster? Well, um, my opinion is that most CBs are limited in range, and so they're going to have limited ability in most rural communities. Uh, many farmers no longer use CB radios, they use cell phones uh, because they're much more um, uh, uh, capable of, of covering a lot more area. Uh, you know, that, that transition went from CB to FM, and now I would say, other than using like Nextel and, and those walkie talkie kinds of communication aids, most have gone to cell phones where there's coverage. And yet, we know that there are areas in the United States that are not adequately covered by cell phones, and, and you're just going to have to experience that. And I know that where I go every summer camping, there's no cell phone coverage except for a very high stump up on the side of the mountain. And you're just going to have to find that point where you can get that kind of coverage. But two-way radios are not probably viewed as the solution anymore for um, uh, disaster response. I'd like to say uh, every, that everyone um, here is greatly appreciated, appreciative of all your uh, interest today and being on, on board with us. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the, in the very near future about your feedback, what we could do better. And again, we'd like to thank you very much for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much.